I'm Patrick Arl. Uh I'm the lead designer and developer for the ArcGIS for Developers website. Uh, this is kind of a continuation of talks I've been doing. I've given one of these kind of at Dev Summit every year as I've been doing a lot of R&D around making things compatible across different JavaScript frameworks and tracking some of the web standards that are getting made to allow web frameworks to interoperate with each other and things like that. Um, you can grab the slides and the code there. Those are two L's at the end of the slides URL. This is the last year I used Bitly. Um, it's now put L's in all of my... So that's, that's that. But as I've been... This year, I've been doing a lot of work in JavaScript frameworks. We started migrating parts of the developer side over to Angular 2. I did some evaluation of some different frameworks as a part of that. I looked a lot at Ember. I kind of looked at some lighter weight frameworks like Vue.js, uh, React, trying to figure out kind of what was going to be the right fit for what I needed to do and what the projects we were going to be tackling on the site. And eventually, it got to the point where I started to kind of feel like I was just looking at the same code all the time for every framework. So this is the same kind of thing that you would do in these four different frameworks. Like, I want to make a button that deletes something. So I have delete button, delete button, delete button, delete button. They're all turning into these frameworks full of components. I can make React components and Vue components and Angular components and Ember components. And they all take data in, and they all emit events out. And it started to feel like it was you know, being back in like 2015 land, where I'm like, I'm really just working with like fancy divs all the time. Like It's just like divs that do more stuff. It's the framework has a tree of components. It passes data down through that tree of components. And it listens for things to come up from the tree of components so it can do stuff. And all these frameworks are working exactly the same way, but they're working just like how the DOM normally works. Like That's the really frustrating part, is we already have a tree structure that has components, that has properties that you can set on those elements that consume data. So we already have all of this in the browser. It's just really a poor way to manage it, is what we're missing. And all that reminded me of is it kind of reminds me of the research that I did in around web components and the specifications that are getting published around creating this common low level component model for the web. So it's really about creating custom HTML that you can put in a browser that can work seamlessly between all these different frameworks. So now we can do just delete button like a real HTML tag and we can use our delete button in React and our delete button in Angular and our delete button in Ember. And it should seamlessly interoperate because it's got to obey the same rules, just like a div or a span or a link or an A tag. So the promise that the web component spec kind of lays out is it's you should be able to write a component once and reuse the component across any framework. So all that common logic that you always seem to be dropping in, that goes to a component and then all the different apps that you have, it doesn't matter what framework you choose or what team writes it or what module bundler they use or anything else. It's just at the end of the day, it's HTML is that interop layer between all of those frameworks. So there's four web component specifications. And these are the four ones that Google proposed when they started circulating the web components idea in, I think, 2012, 2013. So there's four. There's the ability to create custom elements, which is the custom HTML tags. There's Shadow DOM, which is all about separating concerns and kind of abstracting away and hiding how components are implemented. Uh, there's HTML templates, which is about creating and stamping out lots of HTML rather quickly. And then finally, there's HTML imports, which is a way to share and import web components across different systems. So of the four, the two that are obviously the title of this talk is Custom Elements and Shadow DOM, because I think they're the most interesting and they're getting the widest level of support. Templates is really boring. You could do a talk on templates in about five minutes. Uh, and it's already supported in every browser back to like IE9. So it's actually very uh, boring in that respect. HTML imports is the opposite of templates. It's supported only in Chrome, and no other browser vendor even wants to support it. And they all think the specification is garbage. 
So it's not really worth covering that. But there's a lot to cover and a lot of interesting stuff in the custom elements and Shadow DOM area, especially over the last year. So custom elements, they allow you to register custom HTML tags with the browser. This is a bit like create your own div. And a custom element, the syntax has changed over the last year. So there was originally called the v0 specification. That's what Google originally proposed. Uh, and with the new ES 2015 features, a lot of other people like Firefox and Safari started to think we could make this a lot better. And they revised the specification last year. So last year's talk I rewrote in a week before Dev Summit. Because uh, everyone met in San Francisco, they all agreed to standardize this, and they published it, and then I had an outdated talk. So this is what they finally all decided, though. This is already in Chrome, Opera, Safari, uh, Firefox, and Internet Explorer are implementing it right now. Uh, and it looks fairly straightforward. So we have a class, and that class is your custom element that you want. And you're going to extend the native HTML element via the ES6 class. So that's a fairly straightforward mechanism. And then the next thing is you're going to want to observe changes to certain attributes whenever they change in the DOM on your elements. You just provide the names of all the attributes that you want as an array. And that's just a static getter on your class called observed attributes. And it returns all of the attribute names that you want. So next, you have a, the constructor function for your class. And that just creates the basic elements. You can do any work that you need to do inside there to set up anything that you need to set up for your element. The one rule is, is you must call super. So that calls the constructor method of HTML element. So it also sets up the HTML element correctly. And you must do that as the first thing inside constructor, or nothing else will work. And the browser will throw tons of esoteric DOM errors and things like that. And the next three are the different lifecycle methods. So this is how you manage how the custom element behaves over the lifecycle of when it's on the page. So whenever it's added to the DOM, you get connected callback. And that just says, I've been added to the DOM. I'm part of the DOM tree now. Things are going to start happening to me. Uh, what do you want to do? This is a great place to create any children that you might need, any other DOM elements inside here, or add event listeners, things like that. The opposite of connected callback is disconnected callback. I got removed from the DOM, so you need to clean up. You need to clean up any children. You need to clean up any business logic. You need to remove any event handlers that you might have added. Uh, really, they're just kind of the opposites of each other. And the final life cycle is the attribute change callback. And this gets called whenever one of the attributes in your observed attributes array changes. So if I change attribute from food bar, this will get called with attribute old value foo, new value bar, and I can react to that change inside my component however I want to. And then finally, you just say custom elements define. So we're going to define a new element. You pass in the tag name that you want to register with the browser. Uh, you always have to have a hyphen. This forces everyone to namespace uh, everything appropriately. So you'll see me using ArcGIS a lot. Uh, and then you just pass in the class. And that registers the element with the browser and kicks off the life cycle. It finds all of the existing elements in the DOM. It starts building them. And it starts building out everything for you. So every year I get to cook up new demos for this. So this year I decided to cook up a really basic web mapping app with these. And I decided to take some of the JSAPI 4.0 stuff and create a little app out of it. So I created three custom elements. I created a web map element, a layer list element, and then I created my own base map toggle. And this shows you just some of the different patterns that you can use when you create these. And then later, I'm going to actually take these three elements and write a more complex app in React and in Angular with the same components in two different frameworks, but get the same exact behavior out of both. So the web map demo is just what you would expect. It's a web map. Uh, the data comes from online. It's saved as a web map. You could probably dig into my demo and find the, the code for that. And what I want to do is I'm going to just crack open what that element looks like in there. In VS Code. So let's look at what this 
demo looks like first. So you can see I've got a pretty standard looking HTML page. It loads the JavaScript API up here. And then we have some CSS. This should look pretty standard. Anyone, margin zero, height 100%, width 100%. Instead, though, of doing ID map like we normally do, we actually want to style the element that we're going to make. So our ArcGIS web map element now is 100% wide and 100% high. And then we're just going to load a script tag that points to our custom element as a JavaScript file. And then we're actually just going to put in what looks like our custom HTML tag. And this has an attribute that's our web map ID. And then this is the ID of the web map that we're going to load in there. And it's just a regular DOM element. So when this ArcGIS web map JS file loads, it sees that that element gets defined. It looks up all of the existing elements on the page and then starts calling all the behaviors that I associated with that. So let's look now at what the element looks like. And this looks like uh, VS Code is complaining at me mostly. So this looks pretty much like a standard JavaScript API. We're going to require map view, and we're going to require web map. And then we're going to declare a new class. So I'm just going to say this is ArcGIS web map element, and it extends HTML element. I want to observe any changes to that web map ID property that specifies the map so I can add different web maps to this and change them if my application needs to. We're going to do some stuff in the constructor. So the first thing is, is we're going to call super. We're going to make a container to hold our map inside of. So we just want a new div that's 100% wide and 100% high. Uh, we're going to make sure that our custom element is display block. All custom elements are inline by default. So we just want to make sure it's blocked so it actually has width and height properties. We'll make a new map view from the JavaScript API. This should hopefully be really familiar from the 4.0 now. Uh, we're going to point that at our div that we created. But I didn't add anything to the DOM yet. We're going to wait until connected callback to add the map view container into our custom element. And our custom element is just an HTML element, so it inherits all of the methods that HTML elements have, like append child. So I can say I have this DOM, I have this div that already exists, so I want to append that div to this element. And then I'm going to try to set up the map. So if I flip back into Chrome and I inspect this, I can't right click on 4.0 anymore. And I inspect this, I actually see that it, here's all of the structure of the JavaScript API, and it all sits inside of my existing web map element. So now we're at that point where we can start looking at all that. Uh, disconnected callback, we're just going to remove our container, and then we're going to destroy our map view. So whenever the attribute changes, if the attribute that changed was web map ID, and if it has a value, or if it doesn't have a value and we have an old value, which will happen sometimes when it's first being set, uh, then we're actually just going to make a new web map. We're going to grab the web map ID, and we're going to stick it on to our web map, and then we'll actually try to set up the map. Set up map is if I have a map, make sure I have a map and a view before continuing. And if I have a map and a view, then we're going to actually set up that map object that we created with the map view. And then the final thing is, is just in case we have anything else that we need to notify that we now have a map and a map view so we can set up all the other components, we're going to dispatch an event. And this is just like a regular DOM event that you can listen for in any framework that can listen for DOM events like click. So we're going to emit a new event that's ArcGIS web map setup. And we're going to say this event does bubble up the DOM so you can do event delegation with it. Uh, this is also cancelable, so if you want to catch it and stop the event from continuing up the DOM, you can do that. So now we've got the ability to notify other components and our applications that we've got the map and it's set up. And then the last chunk of our custom element is a little bit of interop code. So this adds a property on our element that's web map ID. And this matches up to the attribute web map ID that we already have. And this is necessary for making it a little bit easier for some frameworks that expect to work with properties as opposed to attributes. And it also makes it easier to work with this in JavaScript, because instead of doing 
this dot get attribute web map ID up here, I just get to do the much nicer this dot web map ID. And this invokes the web map ID getter, which then calls get attribute for me so I can get the latest value of the attribute. So that's our, our base map. And as you can see, that works out pretty fine. It's simple to just, if I need to quickly throw a map into somewhere, it's very, very straightforward. So my next demo is we're going to add a little bit more complexity. We're going to add the layer list widget. So in this case, I'm going to wrap the existing layer list widget inside of a custom element and then tie it to the existing map view. So you can see this is my alternate fuel stations layer, which I have used for all my demos now because it looks pretty. Uh, and then it toggles it on and off. So we have all the functionality from the layer list inside our custom element. So this works relatively the same. We've got observed attributes, except we've got a web map attribute this time that we're going to point at our existing web map. And you can see that right here. So I have a wrapper and a sidebar. In my sidebar, I have an ArcGIS layer list. We're going to say that the web map is web map. And that's just going to point to this element, which is our web map element that has an ID of web map. So we can connect the two of them together. And that's where you're going to see that event that I added earlier come into play. So when we create our web map, when we create our layer list, we're also going to create a new layer list widget from the JavaScript API. And we're going to create a container to put it in. And we're going to connect when we add our custom element to the DOM. We're going to also add the container that contains the layer list into the DOM. So that adds the layer list into the DOM. And then we're going to try to set up the layer list. So when we set up the layer list, if we don't have a web map attribute set, then we just return early and we don't do anything. We're going to try to get our, web, our target web map from the DOM. So we'll just do a get element by ID. And if we have a web map and we have a view for that web map, we're in good shape. And then we can set up our map view to point at our list. And if we hit a condition where we don't have a web map, then we're actually just going to wait for the ArcGIS web map setup event to bubble up. And we can listen for it and try to call this all over again once we know we have a web map and a view. So just a little bit of setup code there. And then we have our getter for web map, and then we register it. So that's also fairly straightforward. So you can also just wrap up the existing behavior. And these are fairly simple demos, but you can kind of get a sense of what you would need to do to kind of wrap these up. There's also another method, and this is actually my favorite one, is you can actually use the underlying view model that's associated with each widget and create a custom interface on top of that, which is what I'm doing here in this demo for creating a custom base map toggle. So this isn't the standard JS API base map toggle. This is just a button that I can put in somewhere. And this allows you to use the same underlying business logic as the base map toggle, but put a completely custom interface on top of it. So in this case, instead of importing base map toggle, I'm going to import Esri Widget's base map toggle, base map toggle view model, so I can implement the view model instead. We're going to make a class. We have two attributes this time. We have the web map that we want to target for switching the base map, and we have the base map that we want to switch to. We're going to make sure it's block. We're going to create a button. The button says toggle. We're going to create a new base map toggle view model. Whenever this element gets added to the map, we're going to add the button. We're going to try to set up the view model this time with the business logic, and we're going to add an event listener for click. So whenever this gets a click, we're going to execute our handle click function, which just calls toggle on the view model. Disconnect again. And then this is just setting up those attributes. So if we get a change to the base map, then we're actually just going to set view model next base map. So we change whatever base map we're toggling with. We're going to try to set up the view model. And this is exactly the same kind of setup code from layer list. If we don't have a web map or we don't have a base map, do nothing. Try to find our ArcGIS web map. If we've got a web map and a view, let's set it up. Remove our event listener if we had one. If we don't have a web map and a view, then just wait until we do. And then whenever we get a click, we're going to call toggle on the view model, and that alters the underlying map object. 
So this is a fun example. There's also examples of doing this in other frameworks in the JavaScript API samples. So they have examples of using these view models. This is a way you can make a view, a custom uh, interface for one of the widgets, but then use it across any framework, which I think is a really powerful idea. So we've got those three. We have this little app, and it's fairly simple to put together. We can reuse these components in other apps. We can just drop them in as script tags, and it's fairly straightforward. But there's a couple issues with this. We can't change the content that's inside the base map toggle to be different in every app if we need it to be. Because if maybe we want to put a thumbnail in there when we use a different cover base map, maybe we want the text to be different, maybe we need to internationalize it. We can't do any of that stuff. And the other thing is we haven't actually solved a lot of problems with the global nature of JavaScript. I'm still going to be able to find that button and style it with CSS. So any CSS that I load from something like Bootstrap is going to also style my base map toggle button which is a really, really big problem. And this was kind of a persistent problem with custom elements up until Shadow DOM was standardized. And Shadow DOM does three really essential features for custom elements. And they all have to do with reducing the global nature of HTML and, and JavaScript and CSS. So Shadow DOM lets you isolate the DOM inside your components. It basically creates a subtree that's inaccessible to the rest of the document that you can put whatever you want under and be, remain sure that it's going to be hidden. And it also allows you to do that same thing for CSS. So you can say, this CSS only applies to this little tiny section of the DOM, and it's no longer global. And then it also lets you bring in DOM elements from outside the element and pull them into the element. So we, if we wanted to supply something else instead of our button, we could do that. So I want to go through those ones really quick. So the first one I have is isolation. And if this looks pretty simple, it's because it is. So this demo, I just have a script tag. And we're going to create a div element. We're going to add our div element to the DOM. And then we're going to call the new Shadow DOM API, which is attach shadow to our div. And then we're going to create a link. So we're going to create an A tag. We're going to give it uh, href and some text content to make it show up. And then we're going to add it to our shadow root. So we're going to add our, our anchor tag that we just made into the shadow DOM. And now if someone later along writes some really dumb code in our app, or you know, some dumb developer tries to use our fancy component inside their app, and they do something like query all anchor tags in the entire document and listen for something on them. Uh, well, that's a really bad idea, but if you notice in the console, there's no links in this document. Even though we have a link, the link is inside of a shadow DOM, so it doesn't show up when we do something like query selector all A. But if we query selector all A inside of our shadow root, we actually get that back. And you can see that that's in the second one where we now have shadow links inside shadow DOMs. There's our anchor tag. So if you go look at how this actually manifests in Chrome, you can see that we have a div, and that div has a shadow root. And then inside the shadow root, there's an A tag. So you can actually visualize this just fine in the inspector as well. So the next one we have is scoping CSS. And CSS scoping is a big feature because it reduces all that kind of style conflict that you might always have with, with DOM elements. So in this case, I've got some styling for buttons in the head of my document. All buttons are, have a ludicrously large font size, a ludicrous amount of padding, uh, and they're all light green. So this is all well and good, except for I don't want external style sheets to be able to change the styling of my custom element. I want to style them the way I want to. So we have a button, and that button picks up those global styles. But I also have this other button that's inside of a shadow root, which is getting different styles. And it's getting those styles because I have a separate set of styles defined inside my shadow DOM that's only applying to that. And that's styling it cyan and sans serif. It's got a little bit different padding. So you can actually see, you can then create styles that are isolated inside your component. And the code for that is you know, fairly straightforward. Uh, create a div create a shadow root, add the div to the DOM, 
And then you can also just use something really brute force like inner HTML on your shadow root, set everything all at once, uh, dump a string in there and get that basic component set up. So then the third one, this is actually showing kind of both of those demos at once a little bit. We want to create an element that consumes content from outside the component and bring it into the component. And this is really, really powerful for supplying things like user supplied text, internationalization. If you wanted to create custom modals or panels or accordions, users can supply the DOM as content. So we're going to create, uh, I have in here, I have a template. And that template contains a document fragment with a style and a panel. And this panel is a special new element that's been added to HTML called a slot. And when I add this slot element to a shadow DOM, it'll start to distribute all of the children of that that are next to that shadow DOM into the respective slot elements. So if I inspect the DOM, I turned this slot and this slot, I turned this panel, there we go, and it has a shadow root that's closed and it has this P, which is content of the panel. But if I view source on this, here's how it looks in source. I have a panel, and the content of the panel is actually supplied by the user of the element. It's not inserted by the shadow DOM. I'm not brute forcing it inside the shadow DOM, because all I'm doing is I'm saying, get my panel template, and then clone my panel template into my shadow DOM. And I'll show a demo next, because we've seen all of this, of actually doing this with our base map toggle. So now my base map toggle is still just a button, but it's a button that I supply as a user. So if I view source on this demo, oh, that's the wrong demo. Let's go to this one. There we go. And view source. You can see now that the button that I'm supplying to my element comes from outside that element's JavaScript. I could pass anything I wanted in here and have it show up inside my ArcGIS base map toggle. So this is a really powerful tool if you need to bring in external content and compose it with the rest of your DOM structure. So I want to take a look at how that actually panned out. There's a second version of this which was written with Shadow DOM. So this is exactly the same element, but instead we're going to attach a shadow root in the constructor, and we're going to dump a bunch of inner HTML in there. And you can see now that I have a panel inside there that's got some padding and a white background, and that has the slot. So when that slot gets added to the Shadow DOM, my element is going to say, OK, I'm going to take all of my children, which is my button element, and I'm going to put them in the default slot and I'm going to compose all of that together. And the powerful thing about that is it also lets you do things like, oh, come on. I got all my demos mixed up now. Is this paragraph in the original demo is getting the styles from outside the DOM. So the paragraph gets the styles as though it's outside the shadow DOM. The content comes in, but the template for the panel, the actual border and background, that comes from inside the Shadow DOM. The browser composes not just the HTML, but the CSS from inside and outside the DOM. And then one last thing to see how this is working. If you go down here, this is our panel, this is our shadow root, our panel, and then our slot, you can see the element got assigned into the slot. And then you can reveal that element in the DOM. And it selects, oh, this is the paragraph that got put inside the slot for me. So that's a lot of very cool uh, ways that you can kind of isolate and compose your, your CSS and your HTML into your elements. Uh, it takes a little getting used to it. It took me quite a while to make my first demos with Shadow DOM. But once I got used to it, it really started to see the power of kind of that I could make a custom modal and bring content into the modal just as regular DOM elements. And it would render just fine. So we saw that demo. So we made three elements. We have a base map toggle, which is using a view model. We wrapped the layer list in its own custom element. And then we made a custom element to expose a map and a view 
to those other elements to make them work. And that's, that's all well and good, but this talk was originally kind of about frameworks and compatibility and making things work in different frameworks. So I did the same demos in React and Angular. And this is the same thing as a React app, but I added some extra behavior with this form to let you switch that. And that's actually, this is written as a React app, but it's using exactly the same elements that we just created. So I just spun this up very quickly with create React app, and I'm not very good with React yet. So this is the render function of our React app. We have a little wrapper and we have a sidebar. Our sidebar has our form and this is all done with React. So on submit, we're gonna handle the submit event. We have a form. Um, our form is bound to the state that holds which web map we're looking at. And then you, when you get down here, this is, we're just spitting out, we're just using the custom elements that we already made. So here's our layer list. Our layer list points to web map. Here's our web map. It has an ID of web map. Here's our toggle. It has Great, we're going to switch with gray vector and we want to target the web map. And then in order to set that custom web map attribute, we actually do a pretty standard React procedure to get a reference to the DOM element. So we're going to get a reference to the web map and assign it to this.webmap. And then whenever we mount the React component or update the React component, <coughs> We're going to update the web map, and then we'll just use React DOM. We'll find the web map in the DOM, and we'll set the web map ID attribute on it. And that updates the web map. So same thing. We use the same custom elements in React pretty seamlessly, and we didn't actually have to rewrite a lot of custom interop code or anything else. Here's exactly the same demo, though, written in Angular, and there's even less custom code here. But again, the same demo. I have a form. The form is handled by Angular, but the mapping behavior is all handled by those custom elements that I already wrote. So in the Angular 2 app, if we're using Angular 2, this is the HTML template for that app. So again, I have the same kind of form. We have the layer list in the sidebar. Here's our Angular form controls. The value of the input is bound to web map. Whenever it changes, we're going to handle the change. And then we're going to bind the web map ID attribute to the value of web map from our Angular component, which is right here. So our web map is going to equal that default kind of alternate fuel stations map that I've been using, the dark one. And then when it switches, it actually just switches the value of the web map uh, property inside of Angular. That gets propagated into the custom element, and we have the interop. So that's, you know, you can do the same thing in Ember. I think last year I actually did this demo in like six frameworks, and it took me like a week and a half. Uh, I'm not doing that again. But you can see it in React. You can see it in Angular. It also works in Ember. You can get it to work in Angular 1 uh, fairly easily. Uh, Angular has generally been kind of the best at easy interop. Uh, React is not too far behind. They have a PR for their next major release that uh, lets you bind any attribute, so you don't even have to do the ref uh, workaround anymore. So if you're actually going to take this approach, which there are a couple of use cases that I would actually really recommend taking and look at custom elements or look at something related to custom elements, you should always try to maximize the compatibility of your custom element with the DOM. And that means whenever you need to notify something of a change, you always use dispatch event, and you always emit a custom event type that you can make. And that just lets you set a custom event name so you don't have to use an existing event type. Uh, also, some frameworks, like Ember, uh, really pitch a fit if you have things like hyphens or dots in your event names. So web, web hyphen map hyphen setup is actually a terrible event name and breaks in Ember because all DOM events are all lowercase with no spaces or any kind of separation. So some frameworks have come to expect that as, a work, as kind of a working standard. And then the last one is always declare matching properties for your attributes. And this one is actually kind of particular to Angular 2. Angular 2 expects that when I bind something in a template, I bind it to a property that exists on that DOM element instead of an attribute. 
So always declare that extra get attribute name and set attribute name and tie that back to your attribute, and you'll have a very compatible custom element. So this is the dev status, and this changes you know, yearly or weekly. Uh, you can see templates is really good. Templates got approved really fast. Browser vendors loved it. Uh, custom elements is in Chrome and Safari right now. Firefox, it's in active development. Uh, Edge, which is the new version of IE, you can kind of think of it like IE 12. Uh, that's starting development soon. They've confirmed that on their status page. These are all links if you're super curious that I'm lying to you. Uh, Shadow DOM, also in Chrome, also just launched in Safari 10. Uh, Firefox, it's in development. They've got active tickets for it. And then Edge is uh, very likely to begin development of it soon. It's pretty high on their platform tracker. So you can see this is actually finally really starting to gain a lot of traction with browser vendors. And they're going to support all of it really, really soon. So you can use custom elements today. We're actually using custom elements all over the developer's website to encapsulate little bits of logic that we need throughout the site. Uh, things like search, download buttons, blog feeds, that's all encapsulated as custom elements. Uh, we're using this really lightweight uh, polyfill. You just load the polyfill before creating any of your elements, and it lights up the spec for you. We're also compiling all of our custom elements with Babel beforehand to make that ES2015 class syntax that you have to use for custom elements work uh, back in IE11. So if you do those two steps, you can actually get this working really easily. Uh, so these are some of ours. We've got developer's download button. Whenever you click download anywhere on the site, it's actually this custom download button that we've got. Uh, the sign-in, the actual iframe that we display from ArcGIS Online is wrapped in a sign-in element. Uh, the developer's search, that's a custom element when you open up that new search experience. There's a couple other ones. The blog feeds that get pulled in on all the home pages are all custom elements. All in all, we have about 16 elements. And this pattern has worked out really well because we get to encapsulate these and we distribute them amongst all of the different pieces of the site. And that's really where I think the best use case for this is. If you only have one technology stack or you're only building one application, this really might not be the approach for you. Just go with whatever JavaScript framework you're using because it's not worth it. You don't need to share that code. But if you really start to notice that I'm developing the same layer list for Angular and React and this other thing, why don't I just write that once and then share the same behavior across all these platforms? That's really a smart use case for custom elements. So don't make apps with this. It's a terrible, terrible idea. Just make the little UI components and then use the little components. Um, Shadow DOM is a little bit of a different story. Uh, don't use it today, right? Unless you're targeting only Chrome or only Safari, it's just the, the polyfills aren't there yet. Um, there's two, and they're supplied by the Web Components team, which is the team that kind of is behind Polymer. And they're called Shadow, Shady DOM and Shady CSS. So Shady DOM implements the APIs that you need, and Shady CSS implements the CSS scoping uh, using some, some string replacement and some other fancy things. They're both a little unstable. I've actually filed bugs against Shady DOM in Firefox. Uh, if you load Shady DOM on any page, all of the carrots, the little cursor indicators, disappear from all of your inputs. It's only a minor usability issue at this point. So they've confirmed that they're going to fix it. Once they fix it, I think these two things are going to be ready. They're at kind of a 1.0 release candidate, just fixing up the last few bugs. So definitely soon. Soon we're going to get kind of the latest version of every browser is going to support this. We'll have good polyfills. We can start really playing around with Shadow DOM. Um, you know, hopefully next year's, next year's demo of this is going to actually be really cool. It'll work in every browser. So that is kind of the future, though. Shadow DOM is getting wide support. Custom Elements is already pretty easy to use today if you've got some JavaScript skill. Um, so you can start really, really building this stuff out. And that's uh, what I've got. I've got about 15 minutes for questions. So that's the slide. Uh, I believe those are all L's. I don't really know anymore. So someone tell me if that's super wrong, and I'll just make a new link. Um, so other than that, uh, please leave me feedback. Download the Esri Events app. Find this session. It's Custom Elements and Shadow DOM, Cross Framework Web Development. 
uh, find that in the app and just leave a review. This is there's no excuse now because it's super easy. You don't have to remember any magic codes or anything. So that's all I've got. I'm going to leave this up until uh, I've got to vacate the room. So thank you. <laughs> so is there any questions? I say you first. Uh, so you said don't use uh, what custom lets components if you've only got one. <laughs> That would be another pretty valid use case. So if you want to, the question was, is maybe doing future proofing against moving frameworks maybe a use case for this? And I'd probably say yes. So if you're thinking about moving to different frameworks, I'd evaluate all the frameworks first and evaluate how they handle web components. Um, some are a little bit better, better than others right now, but then moving some of that logic into components might be a way to speed your transition up. So. Any other questions? Cool. I guess that's it. I'll hang. What? That's the exact same question I was going to ask. Oh. All right. Well, fine. <laughs> OK. I'll leave this up for another couple minutes. Thank you.